Jeremiah and Neo got a banger. You hear me? That thing cold, man. Mm. Mm. Cold. What's up, cold little brother almighty? Bro, I'm trying to be like you, you see? I, look, it's growing in. I've been seeing your journey on the gram, and I must say that it's filling in quite nice. First time I've ever been able to put a comb in it. I didn't, re I didn't even realize that that's the thing. Like, the first time I've been able to... You got to comb that thing, train it down. You know, I was nervous, though, because when you and Marlon had your thing and then you were growing it, and then you cut it, I, I was nervous. I was like, I'm not. I hope it grows back the right way. Can you imagine where I would be now if I didn't cut it that one time? I'd have been old. I, I'd have been good. You'd have been here. I know. I know. Yeah. But your, your, yours is darker, too. It looks That thing looks good, man. Well, I, I got the gray coming in here. People always ask, do I Beijing? I do not. I only get gray in here and here, and I, and I let it bang, basically. That's big business, baby. That, that's To have that thing with no grays, man, I got them poking in, bro. You know, yeah. we my, do what my, we can do. It's right by me two ways, my skin and my name so i'm a, i'm attributing that to him because it looked like he spit me in the air in our form but i want to do something before we start tkbs uh terrence you know i've been a part of your journey and witnessed your journey uh for quite some time now um i want to say what 2006 when you started um like really you know started 106 and this that and the third i think i was i was around you and to see your growth man you know it's a pleasure honestly bro because I think in this business, we get sidetracked with all the energies around us. And to maintain your own energy is vital. And, brother, you've done that, man. You're so professional. And you're a great example for the uh, host coming up behind you. So cheers to you, my brother. I love cheers, you. Cheers, man. I, I appreciate that. I remember I was in Atlanta, like, after college. And and this is like the, that was like the Ryan Kenny days. You guys had the line and Studio Forty Three, wow. and um, I think it was Jocelyn or somebody was like either working there, interning, and I and I just you know I got on. I know y'all had the shirts. Y'all kind of y'all started the whole button down shirt. Jay Z changed clothes like that was all. Y'all was just like the cool, you know, the cool cats, man. And I I looked up to you. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think I went by one of your offices or something at the time, and, man, I was just really inspired by you. And every time we would just cross paths, you know, back, like you said, like 06, 05, 07, something like that, you was just always just, you know, fly as hell and really, really nice. And, like, you know, I just looked up to you, man. You just, you just you know, you, you gave a bar, and, uh, and I appreciate you. Well, I want to um, – you're always framing artists and framing culture, and I want to frame you today. I want to take people – on a trip down memory lane with Terrence J. And, you know, a little fun fact, I didn't even know this, actually. I always thought you were from North Carolina, but you were born in Queens, New York. Yeah, yeah, I was uh, born in Queens. I've never met my dad. My mom got pregnant when she was 17. And I, I lived in New York until I was around 10. And we, you know, the, the, the block that we were on, uh, we were living in Woodside at the time. Right. And uh, we moved from Jamaica, Queens to Woodside and, and things were just getting bad. This was, you know, the, the 90s, things weren't as, you know, it was, it was, it was a tough time. And yeah. so that's when we moved down to North Carolina um, and, and my, we, you know, moved to an apartment in, in Raleigh and uh, kind of bounced around. I went to a lot of different uh, middle schools and high schools. Um, from New York to North Carolina and stayed with my grandma and just, you know, kind of bounced around. And I think that's where I formed my, my personality because I was always going to a new school and I had no brothers and sisters. So you had to, to have a big personality to stand out. So, you yeah, know, that's, that's why where I, I really, I took to you early when I found that because much like yourself, you know, I grew up with my mother. She was a, she had me at 18 and, you know, I was her pork and bean baby. So it it'd be moving here there we i go to school in one apartment come home in another and it was it was real but a mother's love and we're gonna get into that um a little later but a mother's love man that was something something different for us for, for me and you because i know that really put the battery in our back one that's why we've always had great relationships with women but then two you know like you said going from at 10 years old from new york to north carolina like that was fish mm -hmm. out of water like you, oh, you know, New York was turnt in the '90s. To go to North Carolina, we were slow. What was that transition like? You know, it was a bumpy ride. I was just, you know, those are formative years. So I was just, 
you know, getting into my groove in New York and, you know, the music and the culture and just the, the vibe, you start to absorb it at a young age. So going to North Carolina was different. But, you know, when I look back at it, it was a blessing. Um, North Carolina, you know, showed me, you know, how to be a gentleman, how to yeah. navigate. You're in the South. Like, it's a completely different thing. And I was able to start off in radio uh, really early. I'm sure you probably won't go on your path on interview, so I'm not going to. But Don't but fuck up my timeline. Terry. I know. Don't, I don't fuck, fuck up the up timeline. timeline. But because I was in North Carolina, I think I learned and got experiences that I'm not sure I would have gotten being young in New York. And so I, I, I look back at North Carolina and, you know, I always say I'm from North Carolina because I, I, I appreciate my time being from there. So I love New York, of course. I was born there. I've, I've lived there most of my life. But North Carolina is really special to me. Yeah, and it's something about the South, man. You know, I'm, I'm like you. I didn't go quite as young, but after I got out of my trouble in D.C., moving to Atlanta, it changed my perspective. You know what I mean? It slowed me down. Not, yeah. I mean, I, you know, we were wild young, but we, it slowed me down and to pay attention to what was going on around you. And um, I, I can see that in you from being raised in a Southern town. You know what I'm saying? So, so you get there in the 10th grade, you know, let's fast track to high school. When did you see, because like myself, you know, it was probably 10th grade, I realized that people are my thing. And I, I started moving pieces on the board. When, when was that for you in high school or before? Um, probably around, now that you say it, probably around that time. Probably around 10th grade, That's 11th crazy. grade. Uh, yeah, right around that time, you know. Um, I was working on a farm uh, randomly in, in North Carolina wow. uh, when I was like 15. And the the local footlocker did like an event at the farm, like a little company retreat or whatever. And then I, I, I met them. And so I started working at Foot Locker in the mall. And I kind of came into my personality at the Foot Locker. And then the radio station uh, did a remote at the Foot Locker when I was like 16 years old. Right. And it just was like, boom, boom, boom. When they when I met the radio people, I was like, oh, I want to work there. I love music. Yes. Let me just be an intern. And that kind of started my career. So when I was 16 years old, I had my own radio station in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And, you know, this was back. You had to put the CDs in it and play it and do the whole thing. And, you know, I had my own Sunday afternoon show from what, 12 what was to your, 6. What was, your, uh, what was your intro to your show? What was the intro? Probably like Ja Rule, LL Cool J, uh, you know, something like that. I, I used to think I was a rapper at the time, so I, I might have spit some bars on my own intro. And uh, yeah, man, I, 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 that was the foundation of everything, man. It was was starting my career on radio, and and you know, I love music, so that 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 really started me off. So you're in high school, you're on the radio. What type of energy? did that give you? Because I know like for me, you know, when I was trying to figure it out and then I finally got into something that ended up propelling me to the next phase of my life, it was kind of like, I mean, definitely school, like, like I mean, like the, the teaching, you know, portion of school, but at the same time, it also like puffed my chest out a little bit more. Was it like that for you too? Um, it, it, I, I think you're cooler than me, man. It happened a little later for me. You know, radio, I was, I was isolated in the box. So I just would literally, when school was over, I would go to the radio station and be there every day, just learning, just finding out what was going on. And then I was the only child, so I had nothing to really bounce off of. And then in, in school, I just, I wasn't really academically gifted at the time like that. So I, I just, you know, I was kind of a, an introvert, extrovert, wow. if that makes wow. sense. Like, I, I wasn't like a big personality in person yet. I was I was developing that, you know, on, you know, camera and on radio, but I, I wasn't as big in, in, in person. I was still, you know, had my insecurities and, and still was developing those those traits. So I, I wasn't quite there yet. And I was never cool. I was never like the cool kid. Like I was always kind of, a, you know, an outsider and because I bounced around so much. So I never had like genuine relationships right. and genuine friendships. So that, that all had to be developed. Like college was really my blossoming into to all of those things. But in high school, I still wasn't there yet. So you graduate from high school, you go to North Carolina, a and State University. Um, big shout out to all my HBCU alumni and uh, that are still in school. 
because we have some 24 year olds i mean 22 year olds and 21 year olds that watch terrence so it's amazing when you look at your statistics and see who actually listen and watch but yeah so i um i myself went to an hbcu morris brown i only went for a semester you graduated with a degree what was it like at north carolina a t so my mom didn't get to go to college because she had me and so it was so important for uh, me to go on her Big shout to mom and them. We love Big you, shout mommy. to mom and them. I love my mom, too. Big shout to mom and them. So she, so I wanted to work. I wanted to just stay at radio and work a radio job. And my mom was like, nah, you got to go at least go for one year for me. When I started, man, I, I, I applied to Carolina, to Duke, to all of the schools. Nobody let me in. a t was the only school that I got accepted into that I applied to. And so they took a chance on me. So when I talk about HBCUs now and why they mean so much to me, I would not have gotten a college degree if it wasn't for an HBCU. And yeah, for sure. That was and a presidential so, statement. So every time you say something presidential, you get the name. I get that. Okay, nice, nice. I like that. I, I love, we got we to talk about this show too, because I, I love it. We're going to come. So, so I'm in college, first semester, second semester, academic probation, didn't really do it. I met a, a, two professors, um, uh, Sheree Lofton and Gail Wiggins, that really changed my life. Uh, Sheree, rest in peace. And, you know, they was the ones that told me about internships and I was working on an on-campus radio station. And that led to me working at 102 Jams in, in Greensboro. And, um, and then, you know, one thing led to me pledging a fraternity. And so now I'm Omega Sci Fi. Now I got brothers, you know, Fred and Travis. And those are my brothers. One time for Fred. I love you, Fred. Wherever you're at in the world. Fred. Yeah, you know, those are my brothers that I met then. And, and they've been my brothers ever since, you know, 20 years now. And so, <clears throat> so yeah, so that, and then I ran for student body president my senior year. And so that's when I really got politically involved and, and, and I really started knowing that my voice can make a difference. And so all of it was like the one, two, three, and, and it, it was just a matriculation. And that's why, you know, I, I love HBCUs, man. If it wasn't for that opportunity, and if it wasn't for, you know, the, the bros of Omega Sapphire and the Deltas, like they really crafted me um, Yo, and made I, me I love that. You know, you know what else I love, Terrence? I love your work ethic, man, because, you know, you, you saying you're an introvert and to see how powerful your presence is now, it took a lot of work, but I want to, I want to go to, to, to North Carolina A&T for a minute because I don't think you're really giving, you know, we, we, you and I, we've done a lot of work with HBCUs. And the reason why we continue to go back to this day because it's some of the best times we've ever had in our fucking life, even till today. Can you give us a amazing, and you're a mega sci-fi, big shout to Chauncey Hamlin who's on here as well. Um, you know, what's the most amazing moment at a and You can give me one, two, three. I mean, I know you had some crazy moments. You know, I'm thinking in my head, was when I was uh, uh, student body president, it was my senior year. Wait, you were, student bo you were student body president at fucking yeah, yeah. a Yeah, I was Come student on, body president Terrence. at a &T. Yeah, You're the gift yeah. that keeps on giving. Yeah, that year, we bought a very young 50 Cent, a very young Kanye West, a very young John Legend, you know, all to campus to perform. All of those, like, like doing those shows, those were like the first events I ever put on. So I am, what, 20 years old with a $500,000 budget and now learning budget allocation and now learning talent management and dealing with talent. And so, you know, when, when 50 Cent came in and, and, you know, I remember we picked up uh, uh, some artists. We used to pick them up from the airport. You know, right. I remember DJ Envy came down. We picked up DJ Envy and my and brother to a, a, a gym jam. You know what I'm saying? And so I remember like all of that. So yeah, that senior year at ANT, man, being the bros, being in student body, that that was that was that was it for me, man. You know what, man? That's you know, because college people don't really understand. I mean, college is an experience all of in itself, right? But when you talk about HBCUs and you go into other schools to see how they rock and how they get that, because I know the Aggie pride is real. But if you oh. go to them Panthers down at CAU or you go, you know what I'm saying, and them Grambling, you know what I mean? Like, it's a whole – and I just appreciate that experience so much because it taught me a lot about my people. You know, it's like when you think about the black experience, 
you know, HBCUs gives you everything from the rooter to the tutor. You can see the high-end medical students focused in finance, this, that, and the third. You can see the people that are just there and hanging out that make the experience that much better because of their presence. I mean, you have everything in between. So big shout out to all the Aggies on here because I see they running amok talking about Aggie pride, purple and yellow. <laughs> and, and it's inspiring, man. I would see you down at CAU when I would make my first road trips, man. And and Kenny, so so Kenny is a curator of very good taste and very quality things, right? And so you'll just see Kenny with a really heavy pair of shades. And you just wear, you know, if you got a pair of Ray-Bans that you bought for a hundred dollars, that's everything. And then you'll just see these things sitting on Kenny's face and they're heavy, and the, the lens is kind of and like I just I remember like I, these are all images of me being 23, 24, because you would do, you know, the college shows. I would see you down there, Spellman, like you was all up in there. And I would just see like the things that you were wearing. And I remember just looking at the swag and I was like, yo, who the fuck is this guy? Like, and I mean, all of those things are aspirational. And yeah. now people have Instagram, right? You can look at things, like when you look at, when you look at how fly Pop Smoke was at age 20, like, as I'm as I looking back, like, yo, my youngin was so fly. Like, his curation was in, impeccable. But it's we didn't energy. have that. Exactly. At 20 years old, we, we didn't see that, right? So I remember coming down there, going to HBCU, seeing you on the mic doing things. Like, all of that, you know, it was inspiring, man. HBCUs, I mean, like, because, yo, all you had growing up was, like, the, the ball players and the drug dealers. Now it's like, oh, these cats are <clears throat> in a collegiate world, Shaka Zulu and Luda, yeah. and all, like this is different, you know. So, so yeah. kudos to the to the HBCUs. Thank you, man. Yeah, me too, man. I I just feel like it saved my life on so many. I mean, black women. We're gonna get into that, but black women in the HBC and HBC Morris Brown in particular uh, saved my life. It, it taught me so many things I needed and equipped me equipped me with so many things that I needed to go forth on my journey. But you graduate North Carolina A and T State University, um, mm -hmm. Aggie Pride. Um, you go and work for a sports agency in a diversity department. Like you're doing all these amazing things, but how do you not immediately go in? You kind of had a detour before you, before we get to the next thing. Wow, yo, you damn. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about you. Yo, your research department or you, whoever's doing your, 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 your the Kenny Burns show is real. Um, so when I was at a &T, that professor, wow. That professor I was telling you about, uh, Gail Wiggins, yep. gave me an application for an internship for NASCAR um, my sophomore year. And I got the internship. And then every year after that, sophomore, junior, senior, I was working at NASCAR in their diversity department, right? Right. So I was the guy that was, like, on the phone, cold calling Jamie Foxx and Jennifer Hudson's agents to get them to, to wave the flag or sing the national anthem at a, at a NASCAR race to bring diversity to the sport. I, yeah. I ran their internship department after my like second year of doing it. So I was, I, I was like, working at NASCAR. I went to all the tracks. I went to all the speedways. I used to give tours. So I used wow. to get like young black kids to come to the track and give them tours. Uh, and so when I graduated, everybody told me, yo, you got to work a job. Like you got to, you know, yeah. get a 401k and work a job. And so I decided to, to leave radio, leave broadcasting behind to, to work a job. Now, you know, I appreciate my experience there. I learned a ton, but I wasn't passionate about it. And, and I missed, you know, being on radio and doing things yeah. like that. And so it was, uh, it, was, it was Fred and Trav that told me about the BET um, auditions after I was working at NASCAR for about a year. And then that's when I went and auditioned for BET. And then that's when, when things started changing. So you go, I mean, and, and this is clearly, you know, your mom, the people around you. This is legit. You could go get this. And I just trust me, I had the same. But why don't you try this? Because this doesn't seem yeah. too stable. But, you know, you, you take a chance. You audition for one of the biggest rated shows in TV history. 106 in part in history. Like that's you know, one time for, can you get some round of applause in the comments? My brother? The big, one of the biggest rated, I'm talking about all stations, channels, yeah, I mean, 
So you get, you get the opportunity to, and I want to start at the audition. You hear about it, Fred and them get you hyped, you go, to, you go audition wherever it was. What was that experience like for all these people that are scared to jump off the porch? So I'm in, I'm, I'm in Daytona Beach, Florida, making $26,000 a year working for NASCAR in a marketing diversity department, trying to figure out, you know, how I'm going to pay off my student loans. Right. And my boys call me. That part. My boys call me in New York City and they're like, yo, they have an audition for BET. I had auditioned for a bunch of movies, a bunch of stuff. I've been told no, told them no good a million and one times. And so they hype me up. They're like, yo, just come. I spend my savings, fly to New York, and I'm waiting in an audition line with a thousand people. And I get there to the front. I'm nervous as hell. And I get told no. And I, the person that was in line in front of me got told yes. They made it to the next round of the audition. They got, what's, uh, hey, Fionn, what's up? Um, they got a, a, a green check to go into the next round. And I was like, damn, man. After a thousand people, the person right in front of me got to move forward. Like, I got to try this again. So we drove from New York City down to Atlanta to audition for it again. But this second time around, I knew what was going to happen. I had the audition paperwork and the, and the, the script in front of me. So I wasn't scared anymore. And I, it was just like that, like, get rich and die trying attitude of like, All right, you know what? If the person in front of me can do it, I at least got to get to the second round. Right. And so I walked into the room. I had the same name tag and same outfit on that I had on in New York. And I was just like, yo, you know, I knew the script by heart now. And I told them, I was like, look, man, I don't care what happens. I at least got to make it to the second round. And it was like Stephen Hill who saw that I had the same name. He was like, yo, why did your name tag say New York City? And I was like, because I just drove down. And I don't know if it was because I was better or if it was because I just had the determination. But I've always said that the things that have happened to me in my life, in my career, is not because I'm talented per se or not because of any particular skill set. I feel like there are better hosts than me, better actors than me, you know, people that are more charming, charismatic. There are funnier people than me out there for sure. But nobody can outwork me and nobody can out hustle me and nobody can grind harder than me. And, you know, nobody's going to keep going after it more than me. I'm just very dogmatic in that sense. So even if you don't fuck with what I do, you go, you're going to have to fuck with the fact that I'm not going to stop and I'm going to keep on coming after you, you know. And so that is what led me to go to New York. And they still didn't give me 106, man. It was still, you know, Big Tigger mentored me for a while. And him and Jason Riley took me under their wing. And, you know, I had a lot of people that I met. You know, Angie Martinez was early on and, you know, Mike Kaiser and a lot of people. And, and, you know, eventually I got the 106 job and that's when everything changed. But, uh, you know, it, was, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't because I was good. It was because I didn't quit. You know what, Terrence, man, you know, I've watched you work. Um, I've been there as a big brother. I've been there as a, you know, peer. We've rocked events, hundreds of events together. And I admire the way you align yourself. And one thing I try to teach my mentees, because I wasn't really good at that. You know, my era was a few years before yours. I, you know me. I'm, I don't do sucker. I, you know, I just, but I learned a lot from people like you because you don't have to fuck with everybody to fuck with everybody. You can put yourself in position to get the things you need out of the situation. And I really learned that watching you and your generation because you remember me. I was like, I don't fuck yeah. with you. Um, and I, I wouldn't be outwardly just negative but because I'm a positive yeah. spirit. But I wouldn't go do certain things just because I didn't like yeah. the room. I didn't like yeah. the way that my spirit felt. But I, I really got to understand how the aligning works, how to mm -hmm. put yourself with the right, you know what I mean? So I really respected that about your grind, too. So you get 106 in part. And... How, how did you get it? So you did all this and then you get it. But how did you get it? When were you told? And what was the first time you and Roxy got together and it was about to go down? It, you know, at, at that time, Tig was still doing The Basement. And wow. uh, and he was, like, filling in for 106. So AJ and Free was already gone. Uh, there was probably, I think, a year between the time that AJ and Free and, and we started. 
and there were a bunch of people, you know, coming in and out and a bunch of different people going after it and things of that nature. And <clears throat> when Tigger couldn't do it, we would, we would fill in. And, <clears throat> and just, you know, it, it was just that time, man. I was just the guy. And I think Roxy was just the, the person at the time that that was the, the best fit. But there were a lot of good, talented people around, man, in, in, right. our, in our class that came in. You know, my man Lamorne, Alicia Renee, yeah. a lot of people that were in that class, you know, had shows and were super talented. And it was just when the, the preparation and the persistence met with the opportunity. Uh, it just kind of, it all aligned and, 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 but it was like a year after. And so Stephen Hill just called us one day and put it on, put me and Rox on the phone and was just like, yo, y'all ready to do it. And, um, but that was like a year after there. And during that time, man, you know, a lot of people don't notice, but I was homeless, you know, wow. not like fake homeless, like for real, like living out of, you know, off of people's couches, staying, you know, in cars, you know, multiple nights sleeping in the car in front of the studio on 57th Street, you know, just, just waiting in case, you know, Tig needed something, I'm going to bring him whatever. If I got to bring donuts, if I got to bring somebody food, Stephen Hill, make a folk, like, it's, it's whatever. So I, I, I was sleeping in the car, you know, uh, and, and at Fred's house, in Fred's basement, which was very cold at the time. Right. <laughs> so, you know, but again, man, it was having people around me, you know, as we talk about Fred, Fred has been my manager now for over 20 years. If yeah. it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for Trav, if it wasn't for Quiet, if it wasn't for the, my boys in my life that supported me, and, and I, I would have never, never been able to, to make it. You know, I never would have been able to do it. I, I think it's something specific about your support system, you know, and knowing Fred, knowing your crew. I mean, you know, all it takes is someone believing in you as much as you believe in yourself. And I, you know, it's, it sounds so easy, but it's so hard to really connect those dots in life. You know, you, you seldom do you have people that are willing to just take the back, be yep. comfortable with their position, push you out into the front, and make sure that you get everything you came for. I mean, that's one of the most selfless acts ever. So I salute, you know, Jeff. I salute, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Fred and the whole crew, because I just, that's important. I don't think, you know, too many people are willing to do that. And that's a hell of a, uh, hell of a team you got there, man. So I, I want to say this, though. You and uh, Roxy, you didn't have it easy. You came into a hit show. And I want people to understand, and, and, and when we say work ethic and we talk about TJ's work ethic, he came into a hit show. Now, mind you, he's coming in when probably not the best confidence in the world. He's living out his car in Fred's fucking basement. He comes into a hit show, a hit show, then takes it to the next level with Roxy. And I, I just want to salute you for that, bro. Like that, oh, people man. don't really realize you didn't come... <clears throat> You know, you came and the shit was popping. You had to come in and get it, you know what I'm saying, off the top. So that's big. I, I, I might have been, you know, 24 years old with, you know, $60,000 worth of student debt, you know, living pretty much in and out of cars and on people's couches, no money in my bank account. You know, Fred's mom you making us hamburger helper and we just, just Oh, one grinding. time for the hamburger helper, one and, time. And, you know... And and so when when I, my brain at the time didn't even register the fact that people would, would would hate us, you know what I'm saying? And we just walked in. We're kids. Never did TV in my life. I'm getting this big opportunity, and you know I'm nice to everybody. Like I'm just a kid off the street trying to. And and then people just would you know destroy you. Just tell you, man, you ain't shit. You ain't AJ and free. You ain't. And I mean. You know, it it, it it definitely it definitely fucks with your confidence because you 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 you're not built like that. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't built like that. I just want to say this for the record. And I'm not scared of nobody. You know me. You were way better than AJ. But go ahead. Oh no, no stop, stop. I don't even. And AJ's nah, I mean, my man. AJ's my man. I know. I known him for 29 years. But you yeah, were better. I, go ahead. I, I appreciate it. Um, but nah. So you know, it, I'm I'm appreciative that the producers and everybody there gave us an opportunity to succeed you know like that first second year man when i look back at, at old videos man we we weren't that great man you know and and even by i mean it was a growing process you know and there weren't a lot of examples at the time there weren't a lot of black people on tv you know and you would have 125 kids that would come there 
and you know a, a, a hundred and thirty of them would be screaming, and then it'd be that ten that would be like, "Yo, what the fuck you wearing?" You know what I'm saying? And then the next day on TV, you're like, "Man, I gotta get my outfit ready. I gotta not be corny. I gotta, you know, I gotta make sure I'm, I'm right." And so right. it was, it was all a, 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 a growth process. You know, when I look back at my 106 years, we made mistakes, man. I look back at things that, you know, I, I wish I could do over. You know, me and Roxy had that, that video clip that people look at now when me and Roxy, like, stormed off. Like, all of that was in the script. Like, we were doing a scripted thing, and people took it, and they, they, they run with it the wrong way, you know? Right. Um, the thing that happened with Webby, man, I never felt good about that, man. That thing... It was it was a random day, and the producers told me in my ear, and it, it happened so fast. And then before you know it, I'm into it with an with an artist that I like. I like his music, and then but, but you know, see, let me let me let me just say something real quick. I need my own bobblehead for this one, Webby. You know, it's 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 chemical imbalance. It wasn't all the way that bad. You know what I'm saying? It just was the way he liked to turn up. I mean, I don't know, but but yeah, but go ahead. I I don't want you to feel bad about that because. Certain shit is what it is. Terrence, this is what I always wanted to say to you. Like, I just, you're so nice, you know? And I think your body of work always tells people who you are. And if yeah. people don't come to the table with an open mind or being thoughtful that you got to fucking in there, that you, there's shit that's going on, you got to fucking adapt and adjust on the pivot. Come on, bro. And, that, and that's why, like, I, I try to tell people, and I know, I know, Terrence, I know you very well. You're politically correct. And that's a, that's a thing that I want to adapt to my life still. But you do a great job of being a good human, and I just want to say that. I, I, I appreciate it. You know, you know, when I look back, there were bumps along the way. But I don't, re you know. I, I just appreciate my time I had there, man. I, I learned so much. Um, me and Roxy have a great relationship to this day. Oh, you know, I love that. And, I'm not even getting a check for this, and I don't know why they didn't send me one. But you, that Old Spice joint you did with her was so thorough. Dog, that was, I was like, nigga, I, this I appreciate nigga it, man. is out here. That was dope. I appreciate it, bro. But I want to I wanna go somewhere real quick. You go through this amazing period at 106 and Park. Six years, I think it was. You have an unbelievable run. You kept the ratings. You grew the ratings. You had all these yeah. things. And you were doing things. You know, you were trying things outside of 106 and Park. But Think Like a Man comes in 2012. And I, I honestly thought you did so. I told you this after the premiere. Thought you did so good that I was like, yo, nigga, you really an actor. Like, you really about to. You know what I mean? How, how was that? No, how was getting that role first? So, so I met Will Packer randomly over the years, right? I mean, he might, he might have had a film that came out or something. Like he, he still wasn't where he was as a producer yet. He was still young uh, right. as a, as a producer in the game, and it might even be, oh, I think we met with Steve Harvey. Uh, I met Clint Culpepper, who was at Sony Screen Gems, and they were just crafting out the Think Like a Man. Thing. And so Will put me in Stop the Yard 2. And yep. so that's when we really became brothers. You know, so so now Will's my brother. Steve is my frat brother. So we had that relationship. And they're, they're building this movie out. Right. I was living in New York doing 106 at the time. And they were having a table read. Like, so say the table read was on Wednesday. And Will called me on Monday. He was like, yo, the person that we're looking at for this role can't make it because they, they, they think they're too big to come to the table read or whatever Look at God. Look at God. Can you come to the table read? Are you in L.A.? And I was like, yeah, I'm in L.A. I was definitely in New York. So I took off of work. I called in sick, flew to L.A. I'd never been to a table read, so I memorized the whole script. I didn't know what was going to happen. I just memorized the whole script. And now I'm sitting at a table next to all of my favorite actors that are all seasoned and veteran and Gabriel Union is sitting here. Taraji B. Henson is sitting there. I look and Kevin Hart is washing his hands next to me in the bathroom. And, you know, and, and I've met these people over time at 106. They come on the show. So yeah, I have yeah. relationships with them, but nobody had ever seen me act. And so I was like the only person that was the outsider. Everybody else like really was an actor. And so I, I just was at the table read and I didn't have a script in front of me. I memorized all of the lines. 
And I remember Clint and Will looked at each other and they was like, okay, uh, even if he's not as good, at least we know he won't fuck up the rhythm and we don't have to pay him as much as anybody. So I did think like a man, probably, again, I, don't, I can't remember the deal, but I, I, I did it pretty much for scale. Wow. You know, I didn't make any money doing Think Like a Man. And Will gave me a, a, just the biggest opportunity of my life. Word. And then it was this, it, it started off as a small movie, an under $10 million movie that went on to make $100 million. And then you realize that, you know, I, I became a millionaire because of Think Like a Man. Yeah. So after Think Like a Man, I was then officially a millionaire because I took a chance and because you know, they took a chance on me and because yeah. I just went after it, you know, but it yeah. wasn't like, again, it wasn't, I went out for 50 million interviews and got told no. And it was because Will gave me a chance and I just memorized the script and, you know, it was the relationships that got me in the door that, that, yeah. that, that took my life to the next level. Yeah. I, cheers to that, by the way. Um, I, I think that, you know, when people think about like what happens, for people like when they see Terrence, they're like, "Oh, he was 106 in Park. He that was that was only right. He got that, or he was gonna get that anyway." No, the motherfucker that wasn't gonna read for the script didn't come. And guess who stepped stepped up in the building? You hear me? And that's what I be trying to tell these mother lazy motherfuckers. You understand what I'm saying? You you re you don't realize the work that goes into this shit. But I want to fast forward a little bit. Um, I'm sorry. I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna I'm gonna go. To, so that's 2012. You have a blockbuster. You sell, you know, they sold through the roof. It was a franchise. Obviously, Think Like, like a Man 2 um, was amazing, too. But 2013, and I want to go back to our mothers. You released okay. the book, The Wealth of My Mother's Wisdom. And I, you know, I identify with that because, you know, my mother wasn't the best teacher from the standpoint of, you know, knowing everything she was teaching me, right? meant to do it you know when you're a parent i'm a parent you learn with your children a lot of the time and i i, I really like I, I was i was i was in love with the fact that you did that for your mother mm. because what 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 happens a lot of times is their effort being having us young going through the the, the shit with their families the time they grew up the, i mean the whole shit right they don't get the credit man they don't get the no. love they don't uh -huh. get the hugs, the attention. And I swear to God, I was like, that motherfucker going to make it. But what was that like? And yeah, talk about that a little bit. What, what I realized at that time in my life was that I didn't know my mother. I met, you know, I, I, I went to college, you know, young. And then I started working across the country really young. And my mom was, you know, still back in Rocky Mountain. We didn't really spend a lot of time together, man. And so it just started with me just asking her questions. And, and then it evolved into this book. And that time with my mom of being able to, you know, me and my mom did The View together. And we did, you know, went to Today's Show. We did all these things on the press tour. It was, it was a remarkable time to be able to spend that time. You know, we always, a lot of times you look at your parents as they're these older figures and, we, you know, they, they raised you and that, that their whole life was dedicated towards you because we're all egotistical. But in actuality, they're people with their own hopes and fears and she had her own wishes and dreams. And so I did the book as an as a honor to her and to all of the, the, the young mothers out there, the young black mothers out there. You know, I was raised by a strong black woman, man, and 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 I wanted to honor her and any others like her that are that are going through their journey with some inspiration. That you can be a 17 year old black woman with not much family living in Queens, New York City, and everybody can tell you that you have to get an abortion, and everybody can tell you not to do it, and everybody can tell you you're not going to be able to figure it out. And my mom you know, used to put me on her back. We would be on the train together and, you know, from welfare to the train, to her working as a secretary, to her meeting my stepdad, to coming up with her goals, moving to North Carolina to get her son a better life and, and you know, doing all of these things. And then eventually, you know, once I you know made it, she was able to go to college and do things. And so I know there are so many young girls that are looking like, oh, what am I going to do with my son? My mom, you know, never had those opportunities. And so she was able to do a, have a son that was able to accomplish things in her life. And so that's why I wanted to make the book to inspire.
Man, that, that's awesome, man. And, you know, I, I did, uh, I had an opportunity um, to do a PSA during the awards. I think it was doing either your show or Brandy in uh, one of the pre-shows. And I took the opportunity, you know, to just defend black women because I, you know, the things that yeah. I saw growing up, as dysfunctional as they might have been, they prepared me in a way that, you know, no man in the house could have done, to be honest. And to yep. have, a, you know, a mother and aunts and grandmother who really loved the shit out of me. I mean, ain't nothing like a black woman's love. You hear me? And it's no. not directional all the time. Um, and the experiential piece for me was just, you know, it resonates with me to this day, man. And I just, I, I appreciate you doing that. And I just think that as you continue to grow and continue to climb and hold on to that and do it for those, because a lot of young mothers don't think it's possible to live their dreams out when they have babies young or think they could go forward and be who they are meant to be. And it's you stopping you, yeah. not not nobody else, your mama, whoever was down, you told you to get abortion. It's that not all, you do what your heart tells you to do and know that there's still time to get done what you want to get done. But... I applaud you for that book, brother. That was necessary. Thank you, bro. Yeah, um, but I want to go to uh, I want to go to twenty uh, sixteen. Okay. I had to go back. I had, I mean, I had to go, and then I, I want to get. So you got a lead role, Terrence. You know, you you got a lead role. Okay. Uh, Perfect match was the name of the movie. <laughs> um, you know, Cassie Ventura. Um, if I was a tween, I probably would have had a poster on my wall. Uh, so you go, you ha you do this movie, and, you know, I love the storyline. Maybe I'm just a fan of both of you, but I like I love the storyline. I didn't just like it. Like, I love the story. Like, oh, I'm a, man, I, I love romantic. It. I love romantic shit. Like, I love, I love, I want the union to be complete, right? So how was that? Where did that come from? You were a lead, not a participant. So um, this was... E News Days, I think. And I, yeah, so I, I was, uh, so Shaquem, uh, Comprere, and Yanli, um, my management team, Queen Latifah, uh, they're really about empowerment. And so they had this script that was written, I think it was written for somebody else. And I just, it kind of came across my desk and I, I read the script and I loved it. And I was like, yo, Sha, Yan, you know, Dana, we got to do this movie. And here's my take on it. And so, we, I bought in some writers and we kind of did a, a, a page one rewrite on it, got the script to the shape that I liked it. Um, you know, Boomerang was one of my favorite movies. So Boomerang really inspired me and, and, and the writing team on it. And then we kind of just built it, you know, from, from ground up collectively. We got the financing. Uh, we put the, you know, the two, three million dollars up. And then, you know, the incredible Billy Woodruff came to, to team up with us and, and we shot the movie. And so, you know, all of the the casting, you know, I called Cassie. I was the one that that called Cass and was like, well, I think I called Puff first to, to ask at the time. And then I, I was like, yo, it's, it's, come on, Terry, I want stop no drama because it's scripted. Stop, stop, stop being script. political. Stop <laughs> being political. I called, I, uh, Cassie was like, yo, I got this project, I think you'd be great for it. She was, she read the script, she loved it. She came to play, you know, I called French Montana, said, yo, come do me a favor. When we got Brandy, somebody, uh, like, backed out that morning, and I just started going through my phone, and I was just like, man, I know Brandy's too busy, I know she won't do this, but, and I called Brandy at 6 a.m., and she was like, yo, T, I'll do whatever for you. I, I love you. And whatever you want to do, let's go. And she was on set by 11 o'clock learning her lines to do it. And so there were so many cool cameos in that movie, but it all just, you know, we, between Billy and, and, and Sha and, and Yan, we just, and, and we just put it together. And yeah. uh, the movie's still playing now on, you no, know, all types I, of I just saw it on TV the other day. I just saw it on yeah, TV the other new day. Fans and, yeah, somebody, I remember somebody in the comments said, man, who keeps casting Terrence J in these movies? Now I cast myself. If nobody wants to cast me, no. Wait, I'm hold on. That's what I hold on. That's what myself. I want to say, Terrence. That's what I want to say. People don't realize, you know, how your thing changed. Like right before Perfect Match, like you were literally, all right. I'm gonna be a producer and I'm gonna be in front of the camera. I'm gonna set my company up. I'm gonna do things the way I want, and that's why I wanted to go straight to Perfect Match because I feel like. And we all have our first whatever is right. Like that's your first rooter to the tutor. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so like yeah. to, to see, and then like, I, I get proud 
when I see it still, I know you fucking go nuts. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I wanted people to know that. Yeah, every, you know, every draft of the script, every meeting, every day of production, we I was there. And so when a $3 million movie does $10 million at the box office and then has streaming rights, you know, five years after getting picked up from, you know, everybody from BET to, to, to different streaming services, you know, we create an infrastructure and a, and a, and a financial model that that's workable. Even if people in Hollywood don't give you the opportunity, it's like, man, I don't give a fuck who don't want to give me an opportunity. I'm we're going to create the opportunities ourselves. See, I, I want to hear that more. I don't give a fuck. Terrence, you cursing sounds amazing. Um, ladies and gentlemen, 2018, I want to stay in 2018. Um, you know, uh, Forbes actually said that you were one of the most respected on-air personalities in pop culture. Um, I want to add to that. Um, first of all, how did you feel about that? I mean, you know, that, that getting those type of accolades is amazing. But hearing it from you is even cooler, honestly. Like hearing no, it from somebody I admire is even cooler. So no, you, I mean, you, I, and I, I've given you, know, you we've, we've had a we had a hundred thousand conversations. I want to challenge you though. Now, you know that is a hundred percent the truth. But now your voice is powerful. There is a changing of the guard happening. I don't know if you read my ode to you in my caption today, but you there's a changing of the guard. And out of all this COVID and all this dysfunction, which was pre, you know what I'm saying, this, whatever's happening next, it's over. There yeah. will be phoenixes rising mm -hmm. from the ashes like yourself that will be leading us in a different way, right? And I, and I, and I want you to use your power. Don't, like, you, you know, I had a conversation um, with a friend of mine, Vanessa Spencer, Chris Spencer's wife. She yeah. had made this comment about Kanye, and I want to ask your opinion on it in a minute, but she had, she, had, she had made this thing, you know, Vanessa go hard. So she was on that, and I was, da, 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 she was and so I called Chris, because I know Chris was like, don't, you know, don't. I was like, you don't owe nobody nothing. Like, don't let nobody, if, if you have something in your soul that you want to get off, Terrence, it's time. It's time. All the, mm -hmm. all the handshakes and high fives, it's good. We got to continue to do that, my brother but at the, and sister. But at the same time, you got a real voice, dog. Not only just in the, what you say out your mouth, but the the product and content you make. And the and you know what I'm saying? You're different. I just want you to own that. You don't have to reply. That's just your big brother. Appreciate it. All right, bet. So Kanye Forbes uh, yesterday comes out with this thing, and I two days ago had did a PSA to him. Two people I know how to get at that I know don't listen to a lot of people, and it's Puff. And it's Kanye, because I go back with them. Now, I don't think other people could or should try this at home. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought that if I said, denounce Trump, blah, 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 you can't do that, and then we'll look at 20, that he will react. Two days later, we get a Forbes article. Yeah. The Forbes article starts out with him basically denouncing Trump, saying he's taking the red. I'm not saying I'm responsible for that. I'm just saying two days later, it happened. But what I am curious to know from you, we have a supreme genius in Kanye West. But Kanye West is also not there a lot of the times with the things he says. I want to know your opinion on that. And where should we go? How should we help? How should we help? Since you're in the in the lane of helping, how should we help? Or do you not want to if you don't want if you don't want to comment on it, it's okay. You know, see this goes back to what we were saying earlier, just about politically correctness, you know, and just how, like, I enjoy, I enjoy not waking up and being a headline. Like, I enjoy those days, right? And, yo, know, there's just certain things I like, like, I know if I say them, even if I feel them, what's my best? So let me, let me start by saying how much I, yes, ah, man, let me come Don't back to the question. Let, let when it comes to yay, it's, let, let me teach you something. It's, it's I so started much. off. So I much. Say, I, let me teach you something. Yeah. I started off my statement by saying he was a supreme genius. I, I'm, I'm always yeah, yeah. giving people their credit, just like Puff. Puff put out. Here's what. what I, okay. Here's what I can say about Ye. Right. 
the, the world never gets the entire picture, right? So it's like, he could be saying one thing, but the way his brain works, he's, he's thinking so far ahead that even if he has good intentions, it could be sounding completely horrible. And we would, like, you know, me and Ye would, would we, Denny's was our spot. And we would meet at Denny's in the morning and we would, we would play basketball. And I'm, I'm talking about two, almost three years straight. And we would have these conversations. And, you know, I, when the Trump thing first came, I'd be like, yo, what the? And, and we would just debate. And he has these ideas over freedom with it. all. Of, it's the best intentions. It's the best intentions. It's, it doesn't always, you know, come out the way it should. But again, I hate even. You need to run for president. Terrence, I know, you, you I need know, to run for office because I like the way you spun that around and made it nice. That, that is your yeah, okay. I will I will tell a yay story that I'm that he might even be mad if I tell this story. But so this year I had a show at uh, Howard. I was hosting Howard University Step Show. H U. I was talking, this is back when, when, you know, pre, before COVID and Ye was doing his, uh, his, his, uh, the, the traveling Sunday service and we spoke and I was like, I think I forgot where it was planning on going, but he wanted to, I think he was going to like, you know, Wyoming or Iowa or somewhere to do the service. And I told him I was going to Howard that week and he was like, man, you, you know, that would be crazy. And I was like, yo, bro, you should bring Sunday service to Howard. And he was like, yo, we have to do it. And it's very complicated to do a Sunday service the way he wants to do it. You know, he wants to be around the people. It's very tough to get clearances. It's very tough to get all of those things. It was, it's, it's a very complicated process with insurances, the medics, the, all of those things. And I, re I remember talking to him and he was like, the only way I'll do it is if we do it on campus because I don't want to do it during their homecoming weekend and people, you know, will feel like he's doing it to, to conflict, right. right? Right. And then I remember telling him, I was like, yo, if you do it, it, it costs money. And I, I wouldn't feel comfortable, like, giving the money if it wasn't going to students. And he tells me, on, and so he's like, yo, well then let me know what kind of financial thing we could do. And I'm, I'm one of the, um, the, I'm the ambassador, national ambassador for Thurgood Marshall College Fund. So I believe in giving, you know, always about giving back. And I won't say the number, but he gave an, an astronomical amount of money to make sure that students would have scholarships, students would have, you know, and, and have this. And, and then... He was like, yo, we're not going to talk about it. And so to this day, people don't even know how much money it is, but would, would never talk about the amount of money, right? And so for me, it's, it's this conflicted thing, right? Because the next week after that, people will say, yo, he said this and whatever, right? But I know so many like random acts of kindness where this guy is like, given millions of dollars to help a charity, done, you know, flew somebody up that, that, would never be talked about, you know? Yeah, I want to so say that. I want to say this, Terrence. Go ahead. At the end of the day, that's all amazing. But just like this Forbes article, if you do all that great shit and then you don't talk about fucking Breonna Taylor, now mind you, he gave $2 million for scholarships to be, but if you don't come out talking about the issues, bro, this is what I want to challenge you for because your voice is important we people like me and you you like me you might not have sold drugs and went to jail but you are just like me you have a connection with people that earns the respect of the people so when you say something it's going to mean something not politically correct no but at the end of the day if i know a person's heart is good you can go on record and see how much i defend kanye I mean, yeah. through the Trump shit, but at a certain, and Puff, and whoever else I publicly said something to to try to get them to react. But it had to be said, because you know, like I know, 
people around them, and this is no disrespect, but the day ones are gone from everybody. By the way, please but know, you. please know that everything that I say in person is the so like when he like yo, I fucking hate the hat. Like I don't fuck with oh, none yeah. of that making my so yeah. like every conversation that we would have like in private, I do that. It's just when I get on camera. I know how much, how big the Kenny Burns show is. And no, I know how big your voice to. is. I, listen, I, I will lay there down are two. for mine. Go ahead, go ahead. I will lay down for mine. You are part of mine. You are part of my cloth, my history, my legacy. I'm telling you, the, it's not about being disrespectful. It's not about cussing nobody. When you heard me cuss somebody out in public, you see me cuss oh. people out. I ain't cuss nobody out in public. I haven't said motherfucker, this bitch, at, none of that. I'm going to truce because, see, what will happen, Terrence, they will erase history as we know it. They will oh, erase Kanye. As much as Kanye is, and I, I refuse to give up on Kanye. And I let, me further, like, let me further clarify my, my position in it. And it's the not Art just about War, Kanye anymore. This is about no, yeah, our no, black, it's not our black about superhero. Kanye at all. Yeah, yeah. This is about approach. The Art of War by Sun Tzu is, is one of my favorite uh, books. And that strategy of delivery, I think, is, is so important. You don't win wars by just one way, right? You have to have your ground game, your, you know, now you have your aerial game, your, your, your water game, you have to have your military, your, your Marines, you have to have all things in order to win wars, right? I feel like there are multiple intelligent people with trains of thought that are accomplishing the goal that you're trying to say, right? You got the Kenny Burns out there. You have, you know, very outspoken Charlemagne the Gods and very outspoken Joe Buttons and very outspoken. There are very outspoken people. I have played a, I, I play a different position in this war. And I am a person that can call anybody on the phone at any time I want and have a conversation and sometimes play the middleman. Sometimes me not ODing on camera leaves the lane open so that if you need to get at him and have it, you know, you lost his number, I can now be that conduit in order to accomplish the goals that we have to accomplish. And that is a, that is the position that I feel like I've been like, I was the guy literally in Obama's white house, you know, getting messages to, 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 the, to the streets, right? Like I am very, very, whether people know it or not, I am very, very knee deep with my feet on the ground in the, 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 the hood, and I am very connected on, on different levels. I don't want to lose that line of communication. I don't fuck with a lot of shit, but I keep it politically correct so that I can make sure that if, if we need to do some kind of crazy voting shit and we got like, yo, KB, you called me on the phone? All right, cool. We got to have the off-the-record conversation. You, me, yay, whoever got to jump on. All right, boom, we're going to. Like, there has to be those people that are able to do that in this war. But when it comes to my personal opinions, there's absolutely no question on where I stand. Justice for Breonna Taylor, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd needs justice. I've been fighting this fight since, you know, before Trayvon Martin, before Eric Garner, before uh, Diallo, back, back, you know, for years and years. So right. that my opinions aren't that. I choose not to publicly talk about people sometimes because I want to keep that line of communication open in case we need it more in the war. Yeah, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't ever not be open and I'll tell you why you have a lot of a lot of ability in your skill set right but your superpower your superpower is how you connect with people and that doesn't go anywhere that's not tainted by your opinion or something you're doing on on behalf of the people this is not what you do and what I do is a selfless offering we don't do anything that's really us because we are in the people business Every time we step up to the plate, the mic in front of a camera, in front of an audience, it's about the 10,000, 1 million, trillion, whatever is in front of us to entertain, educate, or inform. So I don't want to, we can go back and forth all day on this, but that's your superpower. That, that one thing is your superpower. All that other shit is great. We're going to produce films, you know what I'm talking about? But we need leaders because, see, Terrence, I come from the generation of false prophets. Yeah. My generation was so about the money and the power because we were monetizing mm -hmm. hip-hop. This mm -hmm. was the first time hip-hop 
was being monetized in the billions. Mm -hmm. You know that saying, do they get all the money for what they did to the coal crush? That's yep. what we were doing. But now if your, your leadership, your generation has to make it right. Because you can't work a motherfucker to where they have teeth missing and fucking hooked on drugs and all the shit that comes with this line of thinking and power. Because again, I want to end this with political, the political landscape, because what I believe, and this is a perfect segue, racism is a thing. Yeah. But classism is a motherfucker. Mm -hmm. And when people get to talking about these last of the <clears throat> racist, Donald Trump, all them, them motherfuckers is about to die. Literally, not, I'm not wishing death on anybody, but their age is telling that this is coming. And that's, their kids are dating black, brown, Chinese, whatever. And yep. so when it comes to the next phase, your kids, kids, or grandkids, it's going to be the Hunger Games if mm -hmm. we allow it to continue without checking mm -hmm. people along the way. People who are in the bubble have the fresh air, the clean water, it's green. Outside, it's going to look like Mad Max and the motherfucking Thunderdome. Yep. No, so, but, I, 100, you know. but no, you, you speak in facts. You know, the, the collective consciousness of the, the, the very young youth has an opportunity to eradicate some of the idealisms that have that have pre-existed us for generations. Like this could be the generation, and that's why we have to set up all the social economic systems to get things done and get things in place. For me, my biggest challenge now is coming from traditional media, coming from, you know, like a journalist, like I'm a journalist, if I reported something, it's very important to have the credibility to fact check to do that. And we're just in a very different world with information and how information is absorbed and how it's disseminated, right? And so uh, as we are staying in the politic lane, I'll talk about the Marlin thing for a second, right? Right. You take something like that, wild. right? I wasn't even gonna bring that up, uh, but no, I was no, no, so Marlon is one of my best friends in the world for years and years and years, right? And just like best friends, we'll be playing cards and spades, like, yo, whatever, man, you were cheating, you were, whatever, right? The running joke I'll always be, I'll be like, oh, man, Marlon, you know, you cheated cards so much, nobody wants to do movies with you. That's why you got to uh, be a six tuplets and work with yourself, right? right? Like, so it's literally a joke between two best friends that joke, right? Now, when we do those jokes on IG Live, and even if we start the conversation saying, hey, we're best friends and we're joking, and we end it and say, hey, we're best friends and we're joking. We're best friends and we're joking. And we're, <laughs> right? People will take a small clip, and we're drinking. Somebody just put in the comments, we're drinking. We were definitely drinking. We have a great time. That's my, that's my dog, right? Yes. And, uh, and somebody said, you don't need to explain yourself. I'm explaining it, bringing it back for a reason, right? People will take a, a, a piece of it, and then that piece will become the narrative. And there won't be any correction on the story. There won't be anything. And then you have to then say that what is more important for me to not correct myself, for me to stand on my, you know, I don't give a fuck, I don't need, or for me to make sure that people are aware that, He's a legend. And if it wasn't him as my boy, I probably wouldn't have corrected it. Like, there's a lot of things I don't correct. But because right. I love him so much, I wanted to make sure that people wouldn't do interviews questioning him repeatedly, saying, yo, why would people talk about Like, so I corrected it because I love him so much yeah. that I wanted to make sure it's clarity. But now bringing it back to the political landscape is now it is so hard to get your messaging out, right? And so as you're trying to change the world, I realize that you can't just do it through IG Live. You can't just do it through talk. Today, later on in the day, I have a conversation with, with Joe Biden's political team. And I don't, I don't care about things that have, you know, I do care about things that have been said, but right, right. now that's not the, the focus, right? right? My focus is now who's actually talking to his team? Who's actually making sure that the things that we want with our agenda and the, the, you know, the things that we want to see happen in the first 100 days of administration take place, right? Who is formulating those surrogate strategies? Who's putting those uh, things together, right? And if nobody else is doing it, then I'll have that conversation off you know, camera and make sure that I'm assisting in getting it done. Because one of them is going to 
be president, right? Yeah. One of them. One way, whether you like him or not, one of them is going to be president. And I can't see another uh, Donald Trump for four years, right? So unless somebody knows something I don't, we have to start now strategizing how we as black people can accomplish the goals that we need to accomplish so that we don't keep seeing these Breonna Tillers. We need legislation. We need accountability. We need people in place. All of those things have to happen to take place. So for me, that has been what I've been dedicating my time for is, is I, you know, I don't have thick enough skin to play this Instagram game, game, right? You know, the things that, you know, because you really care. Start, you really care. You do. I, I, you know, I'm not Joe Buttons. I'm not Charlemagne's. I'm not, you know, like, that's just not who I am yeah, as yeah, far yeah. as my, my skin. I, I, I love motherfuckers. When I read one comment and somebody's like, yo, you wet, I'm like, yo, why do they think I'm wet? I fucking love you. <laughs> right? Like, all I want to do is, is fix this planet. You know what I'm saying? I want to I wanna help our youth. I want to, um, and, and, and for me, I'm baffled that we're fighting this fight still. The fact that we're still fighting the same fight they were fighting in 1992 LA when, when, when Rodney King was, was stomped out by the police and it was on camera. And the fact that we're still fighting the exact same fight when we should be fighting against global warming, you know, oppression in other countries, you know, fixing our animals. We should be eating better. We should be like, there's so much other but I wanna, shit I wanna, that we should I wanna be add on. to that. I want to add to that. The reason we're still in the position is because of the false prophets. It's because mm -hmm. that people get in their pulpits and direct people in the wrong direction. This is, if we would understand that local, state, and federal, right? Yes. Now, mind you, they could, they could keep tricking the system. They could keep trying to steal votes. They could keep trying. But the, the, the reason people died, marched, and fought for our right to vote is because that is the only way, the only way in this system of America that we can participate the way we need to participate in life Say it across again. the board. So I just, Say it again. But that, but this is why, this is why, Terrence, and, and we're gonna sh close the show with this. I never want you to be anything other than yourself, but I know you and how strong your opinions are and your opinion matters. Don't go. I'm not the, the Joe Buttons of the world and Charlemagne. I'm not. I'm nowhere near asking you to jump in that arena, but I am. After having a million conversations with you, share those. Social media age, it has to be in public. It has to because everything is shared. You, your voice will get drowned eventually if it's not. So, you are amazing. You are necessary. Um, and you know I'm always here, and I don't have no cut cards with me. If you want to say something and don't want to say it, you let me know. And I, and you know how I go. I'm gonna be respectful. I'm always yeah. gonna be respectful, but I'm gonna say it without a filter. But I love you, man. And I, and I just, I, I know that you. So it's, I don't know if politics is really in your future. No, but no, no, no. no, 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 no but, but see, there's a lot of power in that, and people like yourself are needed because there's so many snakes and dishonest people in politics. So I'm just saying, I'm not, no pressure. No you know pressure. the people that say they don't want the crown because they actually want it? I'm the person that I don't want no, I just want to help, man. I just want to change the narrative. And what the last thing I'll say, man, just just from a, a creator standpoint, man, is, is how much I respect you. And this ain't no kiss and ass thing. Thank is, you. you know, even with doing this, right? Early on in the quarantine, when we had the conversation and, and it was like, okay, do you build an online show, right? And then, the, you know, everybody's in your ear, you know, don't, don't build the show. If you, if you burn all of your contacts on IG Live, then when you do the linear version of it, they won't want to come back. Right. You know, people will get tired of watching it every week. You're doing like, and so when I'm looking at what you have built, over the past three months, and now I'm like, shit, man. I'm I'm talking to Dion. I'm like, yo, can can we invest in this? Because whatever Kenny is about to do with this show and the brand that you created and what you've done, man, it's just it's truly admirable, you know, from a creative standpoint and from a business standpoint on how you've been able to capitalize on this moment, you know, monetize this moment and get the culture out there and you know be a voice. Like you were already a voice. But like, you know, with you, I say you and D-Nice won the quarantine. Y'all 
have really affected change in a different way, man. And I really respect that and, and appreciate it. Um, and if we're getting off, uh, uh, I just want people to know, man, how much I fuck with you and, and, and how much I, you know, I respect what you're doing, bro. Yeah, I love you in real life, man. You know, I, I think that, you know, after this again, bro, you'll be, not that you weren't already, but, you know, the real phoenixes, the real leaders, you know, for our culture will emerge um, and, and do better than the generation before. And, and that's all it's about. It's about doing better, you know, learning from mistakes and um, more importantly, putting the people first. So you do that in a masterful way. And I salute you, brother. And I'm always here like I've been. Love you, bro. Justice for Breonna Taylor, man. Love, Love you, bro. you, too. Love you, too. Tell friend everybody I said what up, though. I will, man. All right, peace. Thank you, bro. Hey, y'all, uh, I want y'all to go back to Terrence right now and tell him he got to run for president of the United States in 24. No, he's a... He's a he's a he's a savant, y'all, and the best for him is yet to come, man. So y'all please continue to support him. Tomorrow, y'all mean a volume one. You know, these playlists are becoming a thing. And I don't know if you've really been listening to me this week. I think I announced it Tuesday. But I'm coming with an app. And I'm not just coming with an app so you can listen to the show or watch the show. I'm coming to uh the world with a very special presentation. I'm gonna have a radio station on my app. Yes, if you like the playlist that I've been giving you, tomorrow I will have another. Y'all mean volume one, and they will all be on the radio station. I'll be presenting to you guys in about another week. But enjoy. Have an amazing weekend. And um, be thoughtful. I love y'all. Peace. <laughs>